When we come to the book of Judges, we say cycling from sin to salvation. And certainly we see that going on throughout the book of Judges and really throughout the Old Testament. And we also can examine uh, the case where that even occurs today. And we can gain a great deal of knowledge and gain a great deal of encouragement and understanding as we look into the book of Judges. We see in the end there of chapter 4, Judges chapter 4 at the end, And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Then verse 1 of chapter 5, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinayim, on that day, saying, and they go on to sing praises and acknowledge the greatness of the Lord and uh, what just had occurred in their uh, victory. And then we see at the end, verse 31 of chapter 5, So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest 40 years. And so uh, because of the the work of uh, God's judges, we see rest then coming upon his people. And here the case occurs once again for 40 years. But then chapter 6 and verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midians came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they, came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou came unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out uh, from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an uh, Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the uh, Abazarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And so here we see the introduction into the work of Gideon and his work that he would do for the Lord as God's people are going in and out of uh, salvation and sin. And Gideon would be a judge. In other words, he would be a deliverer of God's people. But we see his concern, first of all. God is here declaring and making known the deliverance that has already occurred previously, given the oppression that they were encountering with the Egyptians. And also, they should be aware of the fact that it would be through God and through those that were faithful to him, the judges of the past, by which they already had been delivered. However, they continue to cycle in and out of this uh, sin to salvation uh, mode, and here we then see Gideon coming on the scene, and we see his concern, Gideon's concern. Look with me here, verses 12 through 15. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. Gideon has some concerns. He recognizes, hey, uh, we're not very well off right here. 
uh, it doesn't seem evident that thou art with us. It seems as though we have been forsaken. Uh, and we understand that God has told us, as we look throughout the scriptures, that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. If we're going to sow wickedness, we're then going to have to endure uh, the outcomes of that wickedness. But if we sow righteousness, then we can uh, receive the blessings of uh, behaving and living in righteousness. And God's people, unfortunately, had been sowing wickedness for quite some time. And so by sowing wickedness, therefore, uh, God has allowed them to reap then the consequences of this wickedness. And Gideon is aware of this. And he also uh, recognizes the lack of his ability and capability uh, to be able to wage war against the Midianites. And so he's acknowledging his own uh, personal state there in verse 15. A lot of times we start here and we say Gideon uh, didn't trust in the Lord. Gideon was doubting in the Lord. It seems to me that uh, Gideon is more so acknowledging concerns that he has, uh, recognizing the current situation, recognizing how he and how his people stack up against the Midianites, and also acknowledging the fact that indeed the Lord has forsaken them uh, given their failure uh, and given the sin that they have fallen into. Uh, and so Gideon then has confirmation uh, by the Lord that the Lord is going to be with him. Notice with me here verses 16 through 24. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, uh, then show me a sign that thou takest, talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, or meat offering, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, and unleavened lakes of uh, ephah, of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God. For because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is yet in Ophrah of the Abazarites. And so Gideon had some concerns about uh, their ability to take on the Midianites. Gideon then seeks confirmation, and that confirmation is then granted unto him by the Lord. Notice then Gideon's compliance, Gideon's compliance, starting here in verse 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place. And take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day. And he did it. By night, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death, whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar." Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his 
altar. And so you see here then the compliance of Gideon. Now, let's recognize for just a second how this might apply to us. And we're going to get in uh, to further detail regarding the, the total account or nearly the total account of Gideon. Gideon uh, recognizes that, uh, hey, uh, Lord, it looks as though we have been forsaken. It looks as though the miracles that you have done in the past, they, they don't seem to be present right now. Uh, I have some concerns about what's going on. Uh, but uh, if I can receive some type of confirmation that indeed uh, it is you who is speaking to me, uh, then uh, I will obey your commands, which he ends up doing. So obviously he intended to act upon what it was the Lord was calling him to do by provoking and questioning and inquiring and looking for confirmation uh, from it, who it was that was speaking to him. Uh, you know, when we are battling uh, with certain things in this life and we have uh, concerns and maybe we look around us and question uh, whether or not the Lord is with us, whether or not uh, we have forsaken the Lord or whether or not uh, we are just suffering the consequences of our own actions, uh, we can dig within the scriptures. We can dig within God's word. We can study. Uh, we can look and seek out confirmation uh, to acknowledge the promises of God and where it is that we can find confidence and confirmation uh, concerning his will. God's not going to come along today and do miracles for us. He's not going to come along and say, well, if you do this or if you do that or we may offer up to him, well, God, if, if I do this or if I do that and if this happens or if that happens, then I can know uh, that it is, it is your will or uh, uh, it is this outcome or it is that outcome that, that, should, uh, that, that should occur. No, uh, we have the scriptures for this. John writes in John chapter 20, beginning there in verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Well, under, the, uh, under the, the time prior to the totality of the scriptures uh, being written, uh, God's people did not have this type of assurance that John is referring to here. As a matter of fact, as God's word was being preached, miracles were then used in order to confirm that word. This happened as well in the New Testament. You see, for example, in Mark chapter 16 and in verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And so Gideon here is trying to make sure that what it is he's being asked and who it is that's asking him is indeed authorized by the Lord. And he gains that confirmation. How then does he act upon that confirmation? Well, he acts by complying with what it is the Lord requires of him. Folks, uh, when we are looking for confirmation concerning the Lord's will, we need to dig into his word. We need to study. We need to be diligent to make our calling and election sure. We need to give diligence uh, and uh, be assured that we are approved in the sight of God, rightly dividing his word. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And as we do that, and as we understand what it is that God has commanded us, compliance ought to immediately follow. Uh, sometimes we say, uh, you know, I just I wish I could get through this issue or I wish I could get through this problem. Uh, I've had folks uh, mention before within congregations that uh, they're, they're confused by certain trials uh, where the reason why the very trial exists is because sin is being engaged in. And yet as they study and as they learn that God has commanded them to put those sins away, rather than immediately complying with God's commandments, they then continue to live in sin and then question why it is that they continue to face what they face. Uh, Gideon looked for confirmation, but then he immediately complied uh, with what God had required of him. Let's then look at Gideon's calculation. Back to Judges chapter 6. Look with me here in verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and Abazir was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, 
Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and if it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Now what is it that Gideon is doing here? Well, what is it that the enemy is doing? Well, the enemy is getting its ranks together. Notice there in verse 33. And so Gideon is getting the ranks together as well. He's calling for the other tribes of Israel. He's calling out to Asher, to Zebulun, to Naphtali. He's making sure that he is gathering together uh, God's army. But ultimately, he wants to be assured and is calculating to make certain that God is with them. Because if God is not with them, then he knows uh, they, they're, they're not going to stand a chance. Uh, notice what Jesus speaks of, as Luke records in Luke chapter 14, regarding uh, our cost of discipleship. Verse 26, beginning, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower... Sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So Jesus there is really teaching us why it is that uh, we need to be willing and indeed uh, maybe even have to execute on forsaking all that we have in order to follow God. Uh, God wants to know who it is are his true disciples. And the uh, principle, of course, applies in wartime, and that's exactly what Gideon is carrying out here in Judges chapter 6, uh, as we see not only the amassing of the, 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 the uh, uh, infantry, the military, God's army, verse 35, but also the assurance that God is with them, verses 36 through 40. So Gideon's calculation. Then let's see Gideon's contraction. Gideon's contraction. Let's see how God responds to this amassing of the army. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah Mer in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained 10,000. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I, shall, I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you. 
and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man, unto his, unto his place. So the people took vict victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man, unto his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. And so God here wants to cut down the size of the army. God knows that if uh, the army is large, then what is God's people going to do? Well, they're going to say, you know what? We pulled off this battle all for ourselves. Now, Gideon wasn't thinking that way. Gideon had already uh, tried to, to calculate and be assured that God was with him. He understood who it was that held the battle and who would give them victory. But the people in total, uh, if there were too many, they would have uh, beat upon their chest and thought it was by their own doing that this came about. Uh, Jeremiah writes the following in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23 beginning. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. God is making it clear there, even folks who are wise, even folks who are mighty, uh, even folks who are rich, they should not be beating their chest and thinking of themselves to be wonderful things. But rather, it is because of the very blessing of their existence that was given by the graciousness of God and by the very abilities that God had granted unto them. Note 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. That makes it possible for them to have what it is that they have. And so God's people in the midst of cycling between sin and salvation, God is saying, no, no, no. You're not going to go to battle with all these people. It's going to be known that I am the one that gave you the victory. And so we see Gideon's contraction there, verses 1 through 8. Then let's see Gideon's comprehension. Gideon's comprehension. God is going to grant Gideon even further comprehension of what it is that's about to take place and the victory that is going to be granted. Note there beginning in verse 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But... If thou fear to go down, go thou with Parah, thy servant, down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Parah, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites, and the Amalekites, and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number, as the sand by the sea side for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow, and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto a tent, and smote it that it fell, and overturned it that the tent lay Along, And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. Why is it that they already know who Gideon is? Well, if we look back there into chapter 6 and we notice what Gideon did in obeying God in verses 25 through 27, and then the questioning that occurred regarding the Amalekites and uh, those who it had been done to, uh, as Joash had explained unto them, verses 28 and following, they were aware of the work that Gideon had already been involved in. And they're having dreams, and Gideon is hearing then the result of these dreams. God is allowing him to hear this, and so Gideon then is assured and is able to comprehend what it is that is going to be the outcome of this battle. And so then let's see Gideon's conquest here, beginning in verse 15. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Notice there the confidence, the assurance that victory was theirs. 
Verse 16, and he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise, and behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shetiah in Zarath, and to the border of Abelamahola, unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of all Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mount of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and take before them the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side, Jordan. And so we then see the conquest of Gideon. Of course, this conquest doesn't end. We then see it prolonging throughout chapter 8, and more battles uh, will take place, and uh, Gideon will indeed uh, take care of the Midianites. Now, how would it be uh, that Gideon would be remembered, do you think? Thinking about God's people and thinking about the great conquest that Gideon uh, executed and succeeded in, how might Gideon be remembered? What would the clout be? Of Gideon. What do you have clout? Well, let's look at Gideon's clout. Look here with me in chapter 8, beginning there in verse 33. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Barith their God. As soon as he died. Verse 34, And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who hath delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. Folks, the next time we think we are engaged in a thankless job, you mothers, you fathers, Elders, those of you who are serving diligently in the Lord's church, the next time you think, all this work, and it seems as though the moment I turn my back, poof, think of Gideon. Think of Gideon and think of the outcome. Gideon was serving the Lord. Gideon was striving to glorify God. Gideon lived his life dedicating himself to the Lord's army and to its victory and trusted in the Lord to do so. And what thanks did he get from for it? The moment he died, the children of Israel turned and went back to idolatry. The moment he died, it seems, Gideon's household was in no way favored or remembered positively. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're not living this life for ourselves. We're living this life for God. And we can find a great deal of courage uh, and encouragement when we think of the work of Gideon and we think ultimately who the battle belongs to. It belongs to the Lord. The book of Judges eventually ends and the, New, the Old Testament continues on. And at the end of the day, there's a remnant 
There's a faithful few that remain steadfast, looking forward to the Messiah, looking forward to the Christ, recognizing what it is ultimately that God had promised. And so Gideon, he completed his task and his mission to carry on God's people for that short little blip of time. Folks, our life is but a vapor. James chapter 4 and verse 14. It could vanish at any point in time. Where do you stand tonight? Can you associate yourself with one likened unto Gideon? One who trusts in the Lord's commandments, seeks out confirmation of his will, seeks to serve him and give your allegiance to him in your lifestyle and all that you do. If not,